Welcome to Tea with Herman Hauser. Uh, Herman, we're very pleased to have you and Pamela visit us here at Stanford Engineering School, and thank you for your talk just now on Silicon Fen and the Cambridge phenomena, and the history of ACORN and what's happening in Cambridge right now. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Before we get into Q&A and discussion, can I offer you some tea? Well, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Makes me feel at home. Yes. <laughs> so we have some chamomile here for you. Thank you very much. Would you like some sugar? All with, no, thank you. But I, I really like your tea cozy as well. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to have some peppermint tea. OK. This is, this is the first time I've had a, I, I must say, I must give you full marks yes. for style here. This is the first time I've been interviewed with tea. <laughs> so cheers. Cheers. <laughs> cheers. So thank you for a really excellent talk and overview of, of the Cambridge phenomenon and, and your own work in, in building Cambridge as a key European and global tech cluster. Um, and I understand this is the first time you're speaking here in the Stanford School of Engineering. Uh, but you've been here several times over, over the years. What, Many times, yes. What do you see as some of the major differences between Cambridge and Stanford when it comes to being a center of creation of companies, innovation, science, entrepreneurship? Well, you know, the first obvious one is uh, we are 800 years old, dear 125 years old. This has go, both got uh, pluses and minuses uh, for, you know, both sides. Uh, we've got fantastic tradition. Uh, we've got a culture in Cambridge that's a deep technology culture where, uh, where, um, scientific, where excellence in any intellectual endeavor scores very, very highly. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful... Uh, culture and I've had uh, many businesses uh, with uh, many professors uh, in the most important board meetings if he had to give a lecture he was gone uh, the students were the number one uh, criteria for uh, for them and that still prevails uh, today uh, the in terms of size of course Silicon Valley is the biggest most important technology cluster in the world everybody always compares themselves with Silicon Valley and they always fall short. So what I say is, why don't we compare Cambridge as it is today with where Cambridge was 10 years ago? And then I think the um, results are really quite pleasing. So it's a, it's a very, I remember being asked in the, in the 90s, when Cambridge will have its first billion dollar company uh, by the Financial Times. And I crossed my fingers behind my back and predicted that in 10 years we'll have one. Well, we've got 15 now. So, uh, you know, there is, there is a, a great, uh, and we've got the dominant microprocessor in the world. So uh, there is hope that, uh, you know, it's not the size of Google or Facebook yet, but um, maybe eventually we'll get one of those too. So where at Cambridge are the real centers of entrepreneurship today in terms of student engagement, professor, faculty? Well, the interesting thing is uh, that the Cavendish Laboratory, which is our physics laboratory, was the first uh, department to start an entrepreneurship course. There was an option in the fourth year course to take entrepreneurship. Uh, and it was our business school that uh, was last to, in, in, uh, to embrace entrepreneurship, but they now have. So uh, we've got the physics laboratory doing a lot in entrepreneurship engineering. Uh, I started uh, a thing called um, Enterprise Tuesday, which happens in the engineering lab. Uh, we now have the, uh, the business school doing a lot, of, uh, engineer, uh, a lot of entrepreneurship as well. And we have Ignite, which is a summer course. Uh, so there are lots of uh, activities now at the university in entrepreneurship, I'm, I'm delighted to say. When we first started, uh, um, these, these entrepreneurship activities. Uh, I remember this, uh, um, giving the first uh, lecture at uh, Enterprise Tuesday. We had um, 40 people in the audience. When we celebrated our 10th anniversary, we needed the largest uh, lecture hall in Cambridge, and we had the vice chancellor and the chancellor in the audience uh, giving weight to that entrepreneurship now is absolutely at the top of the agenda. But it's really being driven by the students, is it not, today? 
It's, yes, it is. Uh, it, the, I'm also pleased to tell you that the Entrepreneurship Society, we've got lots of student society. The Entrepreneurship Society is now the single largest student society in Cambridge. Wow, that's tremendous. That's tremendous. Um, now, when it comes to the, the companies you've been involved with, but also new startups today, to what extent uh, are stock options a major factor in attracting talent, keeping in talent, keeping talent, and to what extent have stock options, the distribution of stock options at Acorn and other companies resulted in the creation of uh, new millionaires? In this is very much uh, uh, followed the Silicon Valley example. Um, all our uh, venture capital deals, uh, you, will, you would recognize as the Silicon Valley deals. We always have about 20% of the company in stock options. They make a big difference to motivating people. Uh, we're very keen to spread these stock options very widely. And as you say, we've created hundreds of millionaires in, in Cambridge through these uh, stock option schemes. And that's what makes me so optimistic over the next five to 10 years, because those people that have made money become entrepreneurs and then mentors and then angel investors. We've got a very active angel investor community that then mentor uh, these new companies. Uh, so, so that flywheel is, is gradually uh, working. And if you look back at the history of uh, Silicon Valley, it wasn't really all that successful during the first 20 years of, of venture capital. And then it really uh, engaged uh, to, to be the, the phenomenal engine that it is now. Well, we've just had 20 years. So it, it, it takes a little while. But I do feel that uh, Cambridge in particular, but also other centers in Europe are now firing on all cylinders. And these hundreds of new millionaires, are, do they stay mostly around the Cambridge area in your experience? Or do they uh, some of them uh, move elsewhere, but the majority is uh, staying in Cambridge because it is, uh, I see, uh, I'm particularly optimistic about uh, uh, life sciences right now. I spent, because of the phenomenal success of Selexa, I actually went back to, to the classes. I, I went back and, uh, well, I didn't do a degree in molecular cell biology, but uh, I, I did go to uh, all the lectures. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and at least I, I know the right buzzwords now, uh, because I was so impressed with this reduction in the cost of a human genome, sequencing a human genome, which is such an important thing by a factor of 10,000 in seven years. So I thought, are there others? You know, is there, are there uh, molecular cell uh, biology processes that can be uh, improved, revolutionized, especially with the knowledge that uh, we have in computing and also in chip technology? And at the moment, I'm working on a company called um, uh, Evonetics, which might do to DNA synthesis what we've done to DNA sequencing, uh, revolutionizing it and reducing it by uh, maybe a factor of 1,000 or maybe also a factor of 10,000. So, but I see a veritable tsunami of uh, molecular cell biology results coming out of the labs, uh, making a difference to healthcare and uh, understanding uh, biology. So I'm very optimistic. I actually do more life science deals now than ICT deals. So one, one of the secrets to Silicon Valley success, many believe, is the fact that we're so far from Washington, D.C. and traditional culture in the East Coast. And when you look at Cambridge, which is just an hour's ride by train, um, it's really astonishing that you've been able to create this tech cluster and new culture so close to the heart of British political culture, traditional banking and finance. How, well, how have you pulled this off? Well, this is one of the uh, interesting uh, differences, I think, between uh, America and uh, the UK and the continent. I always feel that Britain is mid-Atlantic. It shares of some of the uh, American culture and, well, maybe America shares some of the UK culture because the UK did come first, <laughs> uh, and, <coughs> and the continent. And having lived in Britain, but being, uh, having, I was educated in Austria for the first uh, sort of 20 years of my life, uh, I sort of boil it down to one most important difference between the continent and Anglo-Saxon uh, countries. And that's the emphasis on the individual in Anglo-Saxon countries and the emphasis of society in, um, uh, on the continent. And Britain is sort of, again, mid-Atlantic. It's not as extreme as, uh, as America. So when it comes to being close to London, 
we perceive this as a benefit. Mm -hmm. And we do perceive that politicians listen to us. Uh, I mean, I was asked by uh, Tony Blair to write a report on technology transfer, which resulted in the uh, in the UK spending well close to a billion now on these uh, catapult centers which are like a Fraunhofer Gesellschaft uh, in Britain. We didn't have the equivalent of a Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. Uh, so so we, we do feel, even as tech entrepreneurs, uh, that politicians are listening to us and they are actually quite keen to listen to us and, and, and implement some of the recommendations that we have. Uh, and London itself has also become a, a technology cluster, mainly on, on internet companies and now fintech. Uh, so, so the relationship is not an uneasy one. Okay, let's open it up for a few questions. Yes, sir. So um, I just started at Stanford last September. I did my undergraduate and master's at Keyes College. Um, and I, you know, I, I agree with what you said about the value placed at Cambridge on academic success, and I found I benefited massively from that. But do you think that that, to some extent, kind of detracted from the entrepreneur entrepreneurial potential um, that sciences have? Because that's something definitely I felt I had to choose between the kind of two sides. Well, I lived through a period where, when I went to a professor at Cambridge and suggested. Uh, that we ought to have ought to form a company on his uh, latest breakthrough. The reaction I got to start off with was, "How dare you suggest that I should sully my pure academic hands <laughs> and do this pact with Mammon?" Uh, and I thought, uh, 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 "Where do I start?" You know? This has all but disappeared. So the first thing that you had to do is deal with old prejudices, but and they're all but gone. Uh, now the emphasis is no longer one of leave me alone with this uh, you know, commercial business. It's, there's great willingness to do it, but there isn't really the knowledge yet how to do this uh, efficiently. So that's what we've been working on. Uh, hence the, you know, the student bodies, the, uh, we've got uh, Cambridge Enterprises now, which didn't exist. Uh, it was one of the things that I helped create at the university. We have the Hauser Forum that I founded with uh, Pamela, that is a, a space where, you, where we have an incubator, where we have Cambridge Enterprise, uh, where we have the Cambridge Network. I founded the Cambridge Network together with Alec Brewers, who was the vice Vice Chancellor, uh, two Vice Chancellors ago, uh, to build a bridge between the business community and the university. So it is improving, but you know I cannot claim that we're we're Silicon Valley. We're not yet, but we're improving fast. Uh, we had a question in the back. Uh, can you compare the technology industries uh, between London and Cambridge? Um, because I've heard a lot about how Cambridge is really more geared towards the hard scientists, or the hard science as it were. Um, and London is more towards you know, the size of internet companies, media companies. Um, but I find that a lot of graduates from Oxford and Cambridge, they also go down to London. Um, you know, there are lifestyle advantages and such as well. So can you compare the technology industries and also the talent between London? Yes. I would make the distinction between hard sciences and the internet. I'd more uh, call it deep technology uh, and, uh, you know, well, apps technology, but I shouldn't be too derogatory about that. Uh, the, uh, and lo there are lots of really good internet companies. Now, uh, it is true that uh, internet companies tend to uh, be located in London. And lots of young people just love London. A lot, so, so does my, my, my kids, you know, live in London because <laughs> London is just one of the great cities in the world. There's, uh, there are restaurants, there is a lot of culture, there is a lot of buzz, and around uh, Silicon Roundabout, as we, call, uh, as we call it, you know, Google is there, uh, Facebook are there, so there's also a very nice uh, connection to Silicon Valley. But what Cambridge still has, actually probably still uniquely in uh, Europe to the extent that Cambridge does have, if there is a really difficult deep technology problem, uh, Cambridge has the sort of, um, if you like, quiet environment where you can do some quiet deep thinking for a, a long time and, and work on it and, and there is the environment to support it. But London is, you know, for, especially for young people, great place. Oh, oh sorry, uh, Ade. Um, thanks for that very great presentation. 
Um, in a number of regions where we've been looking at, um, one of the challenges has been a shortage of fund managers. So to encourage you to boast, how can we produce more of you? <laughs> <laughs> Mine's very very kind of you to say so. Uh, we, in, the UK, in the UK, we've got more venture capital uh, than any of the other European countries. So again, we're mid-Atlantic. But if you look at Europe, per GDP, Europe only has a quarter of the venture capital uh, that America has. So we, we are clearly behind in the availability of, uh, uh, of venture capital. And one of the problems and this is all improving quite rapidly, was uh, the size of the market. Because European markets until uh, recently were quite parochial. Uh, you know, you had uh, in in England has 66 million people, America has 300 million people. But now the EU has 400 million people, and what um, Americans don't normally like to hear is uh, Europe is the largest um, <coughs> economy in the world. Uh, Europe is you know, significantly larger than the US, but it is the EU, uh, it is uh, uh, the European Union. And there was a, a question about Brexit uh, and, and the euro. Uh, for some reason, in Anglo-Saxon countries, the euro has this terrible uh, image. The euro, without a shadow of a doubt, is the most successful currency uh, that has ever been introduced. It is the most spectacular success story. But if you hear, if you look at the headlines, you wouldn't know it. Uh, you know, it is it is uh, second only to the dollar. There's never a new currency has appeared that uh, you know can challenge the dollar, with, 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 uh, with which the euro does. Uh, the whole European uh, program, in my opinion, has been one of the most successful programs that I'm very proud of, because it's the only region in the world that has managed to introduce a layer above nations. You know, we have a, a, a much maligned Brussels bureaucracy, who, by the way, the entire Brussels bureaucracy, uh, you know, gets criticized all the time, uh, employs fewer people than the Birmingham Council. So uh, you know, this is not a heavy layer on top of, uh, of nations. It's managed to harmonize many things and create a common market that didn't exist. So you've got to see it in, the, in this uh, historic perspective. And for Britain to leave, in my opinion, would be a total disaster. And at the moment, it looks as if uh, it will, we will be OK and we'll stay in. But you just need to have another migrant crisis or something. And this could flip very, very quickly. Sorry, sorry Ade. Uh, Dennis. Yeah, um, in the 1980s, I worked for Marvin Minsky's Symbolics Computer. Oh, yes. And I heard all Wonderful the, company. Huh? Wonderful company. Yeah, well, I, and I built a lot of their computers. And we heard the same kind of things out of Marvin and the, the other folks at Symbolics and in the industry about AI then that you hear today. Today, it seems to be much more believable than at the time. At the time, it was mostly, to be honest, hype. And today, it seems to be much more believable in the sense that it looks like it's really happening now. Yes. And what do you attribute this? Because it's not necessarily just hardware. There's some kind of change in perception. That three, three things. And uh, I almost changed my PhD from physics to AI in my last year because I wanted to be part of the team that writes the uh, <coughs> World Chess Champion program that autumn. We were con convinced it was going to happen that autumn. And if I wasn't going to jump ship now, I would miss it. It took another 30 years, you know, <laughs> 20 years. So there was, as you remember, a lot of optimism and excitement. And the three reasons why I think it uh, works now and it didn't then is, and that is actually three reasons. I, I, I quote Jeff Hinton on that, who recently gave a talk for me at the Royal Society that I organized on AI. The first reason was an improvement in algorithms. But he says there's really a minor reason, because the basic ideas have been around forever. The main big breakthrough was backpropagation, and Minsky's famous paper showing that uh, without back backpropagation, you're nowhere, uh, I think was you know, influenced AI uh, a lot and contributed to the first AI winter. So that's a minor contribution, an important one, but minor. The so in ascending uh, order of importance, 
a thousand times improvement in CPU power was helpful. But the real reason is a million times more data. So uh, I think it's just the availability of, quality, of annotated data that you can use as uh, training programs. Because somebody talked about uh, replacing programmers. I mean, one of the big shifts, of course, is away from programming to teaching so that, that you can teach a computer by providing high quality training data sets. Uh, and it's the, the availability of these training data sets that in my opinion is probably the single most important value of the internet of things. Uh, that we have all these sensors out there that will report high quality data 24 seven that we can use uh, to, to train our, uh, our machines on. Yes. So I, I heard you say earlier that uh, that the computer revolution might not produce as many jobs uh, to sort of compensate for the ones that we're losing, which is different from the industrial revolution, which uh, also created jobs, but at the same time gave us many others. Why do you think it will uh, not produce that many new jobs? Uh, well, uh, traditionally, of course, it is absolutely true. We've had. I actually give a whole lecture on that, uh, which, you, which you can watch on YouTube, called the, the Darwin Lecture on, uh, on technology development. <clears throat> there is a, a professor at uh, Vancouver, I think, called Richard Lipsy, who did uh, a study on these general purpose technologies. And he uh, reckons that there have been 24 so far uh, in human history. Uh, and each of the introduction of these general purpose technology changed our lives. They became all pervasive. And so far, the story has always been that uh, these technology changes were quite difficult for si societies to go through. These transitions were hard. But as you say, they always created more new jobs than they destroyed in the old ones. The, the fear that I have, and I, I just don't know, it's just a fear that needs to be thought about, is that this time it might happen so fast that this transition is very difficult to implement. Uh, and I, actually, in that talk, I give the example of my grandfather who produced the, the leather belts for the Industrial Revolution and the, and the big factories. And of course, these leather belts uh, uh, went out of fashion, and electricity came, and there was a motor on each of the looms, so he didn't have to have a belt anymore. But it happened over a generation, so he could adapt. He went into fan belts and things, and it was fine, and his, his company survived. Uh, and it might be much, much harder this time because of the speed. The reason why I think it also might be the case that it doesn't create so many new jobs, and I, I'm, you know, I have no evidence for that, I'm just worried about it, is that I cannot see anything that a computer, uh, that a um, human can learn that a machine cannot learn better. So that's a, a sort of very high level negative argument. Yes, sir. You gave a very uh, rosy picture of EU. However, EU successfully have the euro, but on the political side, right now seems to have a lot of problem they don't know how to solve. Maybe UK sees the crisis coming, wants to get out. Uh, yes, uh, some people argue that. Uh, I. I think this, the, the, there is a lot of talk, especially with uh, migration and the Schengen Agreement that we have. I think this is a transitional uh, problem that, uh, uh, that the EU has. It's, uh, I think um, it's something that the EU can cope with. And I think for Britain to remain uh, part of an organization that's responsible for 50% of its exports is just important for the, uh, for the economy. Uh, but you know, some people take uh, different views, and I don't have the you know, last word of wisdom on this one. <laughs> uh, we had a question in the back. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned EU economy being larger than the US. But let's take a case where there's a successful startup in the UK, and they want to scale to another market. Do you advise them to first scale to EU or US? And if the answer is EU, please can you elaborate on why? Uh, the answer is global. You know, if you uh, if you want to if you uh, want to be a uh, say an internet company or a technology company, uh, it used to be the case uh, that uh, the U.S. had a great advantage because of a very large home market. I think that that um, 
advantages disappearing because uh, the global market is becoming so uniform. So uh, one of the things that I think will be a slight advantage for European uh, countries is they have no option but going international right away. And the choice is not the EU or uh, the US. Uh, the choice is always the whole globe. You've got to be present in all the three major uh, economies, EU, Asia, and the US, if you want to be really successful as a, uh, as a startup in, in, in high technology. And the ability to connect with, with other uh, countries and other cultures uh, sometimes gives a slight advantage to the, to the Europeans, certainly a slight advantage to them. Um, Herman, let's bring it back to the UK. Where do you see the Golden Triangle going? Because it, it isn't just about Cambridge. It's Cambridge, London, Oxford, University of Oxford, Imperial, UCL, University of Cambridge. This region seems very much together moving forward. A lot of good things happening both at the industry level, universities, but also good government in many ways in terms of supporting. Uh, yes. Well, the, uh, the British government in particular is very aware of the fact that, uh, and you all know this, of course, that uh, even if you take the, uh, the Dow Jones index, uh, you know, the, the, the top 30 company in the US, there's only one company that's still in the Dow Jones that was in the Dow Jones when it was uh, started, and that's GE. So even la very large companies come and go. So you have to have an economy that is willing to uh, promote uh, new sectors, new companies, get behind them, make sure that they're global uh, very early on because it is such a, a global game. And you know, Airbus is a good example. There are really just two um, aircraft industries in the world, Boeing and, uh, uh, and Airbus. And Airbus has been a great success. And the, if any of you have flown in the A380, it is uh, you know, a much better plane than the Jumbo was. Uh, it's uh, uh, the 747. So sometimes, uh, you know, Europeans get it right, too. Well, <laughs> indeed they do. On behalf of Stanford Mechanical Engineering, thank you again for coming here, spending time with us. We'd like to thank both you and Pamela for taking time out on your hop back to London to spend an afternoon and talk with us about Cambridge. I hope we continue to study, learn from Cambridge, and that we'll see many more uh, both academics, investors, as well as entrepreneurs from Cambridge coming here and establishing businesses, and also people from the Valley moving to UK, investing in UK, building great companies in the UK as well. So could we please give a hand to Herman? <laughs> <laughs>